in my own teaching anyway, I found a couple of ways to figure out if I'm using too much and how to maintain that balance. And so I'd like for all of you as we're going through this to think about like how you can tell and what your stuff is too. And I'd love to hear some of that as we go. And so this is one thing that I, I have kind of found with technology is that it's not the silver bullet. You can't find the perfect app or the perfect tool or the perfect set of tools and that it can be a catalyst. And so, you know, a catalyst is the thing that doesn't change in and of itself, but it improves other things. The good quality teaching skills, it can amplify those things, but without that, we're still totally missing the boat, you know? So that's what it all comes back to for me. And so for me, in my own high school Spanish class, here's where I started to see the tech overkill happening. So I got Chromebooks in my classroom got a cart of them. So kids didn't take them home. But a lot of the kids in my rural district didn't have great internet access at home anyway. So there wasn't a ton they were going to do with them there in the first place. And so we did a lot of creating in class. Did lots of stuff with Google Slides. We picked, you know, we did some stuff with Skype, just a variety of different things. And I was excited about trying all these things. So we're at the end of a class. This was my, this was actually my advanced placement Spanish class. So it was all seniors. We'd just gotten done with this cool activity. I can't even remember exactly what it was, but we were creating something with what we had learned. It was getting to be about the time for the bell to ring. The kids were headed to the door and I was kind of chatting with them. And one of my students who I knew liked my class, I knew she liked Spanish and she did really well at it. She was saying, Mr. Miller, you know, and she said something and it like punched me like right in the heart. But it was a good thing because I learned a really good lesson from it. She said, Mr. Miller, you know, I want to be creative, but just not computer creative. Or maybe not computer creative all the time. Those were her words and they totally stuck with me, you know. And I started to realize I want them to tap into that creativity. That's a skill I want them to be able to develop in my class and to learn Spanish by using it but I don't always have to use technology to get at it, you know? I mean, for heaven and sake, like markers and paper, you know? Um, talking to each other, there's just, I mean, there's so many things that we can do beyond that. And so at, at that point, I started to realize that I need to get a little bit of balance. So here's what I did with that. I really believe that that balance may be the most important lesson that we teach kids. Um, content aside, a lot of those other things, you know, we're in unprecedented times where we're still trying to figure out life with technology. And it's so easy to get sucked into those devices and what, what's considered human is even kind of like under attack. And so I think we're in a perfect position where we can help kids to see what it means to be balanced and how important it is. And so, have you heard this before? Sitting is the new smoking. Like how, how important or how um, damaging just sitting can be. It's bad for our health, but it's also bad for our brain. You know, they show from uh, MRI scans that our brain isn't as sharp after we've been sitting for a while. And I noticed, of course, whenever you're using technology, especially if it's like Chromebooks or laptops, there's a lot of sitting that goes with that. So I started to see the, you know, the, the detriments of sitting too much. So. You know, for me, sometimes it's like trying to find ways to get them up on their feet or at least to move around. Um, I know with younger kids, go noodles. Are any of you go noodle people? Like, right? Yeah. Just doing a quick brain break. I'll tell you a story. I had an ex especially squirrely group of freshmen one year, right? And um, I had them right after lunch. And they would come into class and they would be like bananas. And there was nothing we could do to, nothing I could do to totally get them settled down until I finally figured it out in about April. I said, guys, you know, it was, I know it took me till April. I'm not afraid to say that. That is just the truth, okay? In April, well, part of it was that it was springtime and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you five minutes. My classroom is right next to an exterior door. I said, go outside, run. Here are a couple of balls, play catch, lay in the grass, whatever you want to do. You got five minutes, but when you come back in, we got to be ready to go. 
and they took their squirreliness out and they got it out for five minutes. And then they came back and they sat down and I was shocked because I thought I'm given five minutes away. Nope. I was getting 42 minutes of quality instruction back by giving them those five minutes because for so many of them, they sat with their friends during lunch. They didn't get up and they didn't move. Those five minutes, those were like, that was the best trade I could have made with them. I gave up five instructional minutes, but it was the best trade. The best ways that I've been able to do this gauge tech overkill with my eyes and my ears. And you can see when, I mean, I can see it on all of you. You know, I can read your eyes and I can, t I can tell right now you're paying attention and you're good. But if you had been sitting here for 20 minutes and I had been talking about something dense and unnecessary, first of all, your eyes would have gone down in here into your phones. I would have lost you into your phones. And even if that doesn't happen with kids, you guys know what it looks like, right? So I'm real big into read the eyes because they can tell you a lot, even if you don't ask kids. Sometimes when you ask kids, they won't tell you the truth. You know, the eyes always seem to tell the truth. And then the same way with the ears, because I'm real big into listening to kids, kind of like eavesdropping, not in a creepy way, hopefully, but like, you know, I like to hear what they're talking about. And you know, when they were talking about something that you did in class, it was great. If they didn't talk about it, that doesn't mean it's horrible. But I think the eyes and the ears are really, really big when it comes to that. This isn't like a scientific formula. These are just some of the things that I think work. Engaging the senses, you know, pulling all of the different senses in. You know, I've, I've heard somebody talking about how like squeezing an orange in class. I mean, those, those sensory things and tying them into learning, you know, the more connections you can make in the brain, the better. Um, the feel of like wood grain. I mean, just all of that stuff, you, you can't replicate that with technology. And I think if we forget about that, we lose out on this big, huge dimension of connecting with kids' brains, you know? So I think that one's important. Digital activities to analog activities. With some of these activities I've done digitally, I'll give you an example. Um, I love using collaborative Google Slides. You know, you make a slide presentation and every kid gets a slide. They do their work in that one slide and then they can see everybody else's work. And then they can leave comments. If I feel like I'm hitting that tech overload space, I can take the best part of that activity and turn it into an analog activity. Paper is still okay to use in class. You know, I'm still a huge, huge believer in paper. So grab that photocopier paper, hand them a piece of paper and have them do that activity on a piece of paper and then get up and trade papers with each other to make those comments. I know that sounds sort of like simplistic, but just doing little things like that, it's like a different modality almost, the non-tech version of it. And so just pulling that in can be enough change to get kids re-engaged, I think. And if it's not easy, persist. So I think this kind of goes with the tech overwhelm thing, but whenever you're trying to do something different, sometimes it's not easy at the beginning. You know, kids kind of like, push back on different stuff. Um, we want to try something that they're not as familiar with or as comfortable with. I think when they push back at that very beginning, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, it's wrong or that they don't agree with you. It's that they just don't see it yet. You know, they just don't see the vision. And sometimes we got to persist and help them to be able to see it with any of this stuff. So that kind of ties into all the rest of it. I just kind of think that's important. And I wanted to leave that with all, with all of you.